Good afternoon, everybody. How's everyone doing? Yeah, great first session, wasn't it? My name is Denise Medved. I'm the Vice President of Sales and Business Development for the Consumer Technology Association. And welcome to C-Space and CES 2016. I am pleased to present our moderator for the C-Space Storyteller Session with Rocket Fuel, Glenn Fittick, Dish Network, and Resolute Digital. This session is focusing on pro programmatic buying. As you might know, programmatic buying has taken people-based marketing by storm, and it's poised to disrupt the largest, most coveted screen in the household, the TV. This storyteller session will focus on a recent successful campaign for Glenn Fittick Malt Scotch Whiskey, I had many of those um, in my youth, just FYI. <laughs> I drink wine only now. Uh, that, that was led by Rocket Fuel, a leading programmatic marketing platform provider in partnership with ad agency Resolute Digital and Dish Network. So I'm going to introduce our moderator, Randy Wooten. He's the CEO of Rocket Fuel, and he's been the CEO since November after spending several months as the chief revenue officer. Prior to joining Rocket Fuel, Randy was the Vice President of consumer, Customer Success Products at Salesforce, where he grew its services and product portfolio and P&L from $200 million to almost $500 million in three years. Impressive numbers. As the VP of Sales, I love those numbers. He successfully led the major overhaul of the Salesforce Customer Success Products Management, Marketing, and Sales Enablement, enablement Strategies. He also served in a variety of extensive sales positions over the course of six years at Microsoft, was the SVP of sales, service, and marketing for AdReady, a cloud platform company focused on mid-market display advertising, and director of business development at A Quantiv. I am pleased to, to introduce Randy Wooten. Thank you, Denise. Appreciate it. You're welcome. And thank you all for attending. Sort of that was a very kind introduction, but at the end of the day, what's been super interesting about my career is I've been fascinated by technology, the application of it to advertising. And as we think about story and storytelling, I think the story that we're unfolding today is the birth of a new marketplace. This is something that all of us will look back on and think about how this moment in time changed the way that we work with partners, with agencies, and advertisers to create compelling experiences in this new medium. But to get started, I want to start off with, well, what is programmatic TV? But we have a lot of different definitions. Just let me see a hand raise. How many people <coughs> have a strong sense of what programmatic TV is? Wow, that's like three hands. All right, how many people don't even know what the heck programmatic TV is? OK, so that's a, sort of a larger majority. And in the middle, everyone sort of has an idea. So let's get grounded in definitions. And we'll start with programmatic TV advertising, and my colleague Adam will come up and go into more detail of how, what this is meant for DISH. But at the high level, you can think of programmatic TV is really applying an automated, technology-driven method of buying and delivering linear TV. That has been what it has meant to date. What we're doing today with a brand like Renflitic, with a partner like Resolute Digital, and with a marketplace like DISH is redefining what programmatic TV is. And it's going to take a while for this to really take hold. But what I would say is programmatic buying, the big difference is about buying an impression. So for the TV folks, you buy audiences as a proxy for the uh, people you want to reach. For the digital folks, you're like, oh yeah, we love impressions. In this new world, we're bringing those two things together, where you're able to buy an individual impression in real time. And Adam will talk a little bit about the distinction between bidding and buying in real time, but this idea of bidding and buying in real time for an opportunity to show a specific message to an individual consumer based at the impression level. So we will be working through this definition today and talking about some of the components of what we've learned through this test, uh, but we'll hold that as a starting point. And so that's what it is. Why does it matter? Well, you all have probably seen these charts before, but this is a reach graph. You're over on the far left, you see in 1954, I Love Lucy, 
commanded 80% reach. 80% reach of TV viewership. Fast forward, 2014, you're looking at uh, Sunday Night Football, one of the most popular shows, a show that is defined for TV because it's live sports, and people watch it live. The reach is down at 20%. So you can say lots of reasons for this, right? There's been a fragmentation of media. There's been this exponential growth of content. There's been a reduction in cost of content production. And I think there's been a proliferation of entertainment choices. But what that means is that what brand advertisers wanted TV to do back in 1954 is no longer relevant, or it's much harder to do today. And what you're seeing by extension for those on the other side is this dramatic growth of spend in programmatic TV. So digital video growing from 10 billion to 15 billion, about 10% Kager over that time. The programmatic TV is predicted to grow almost 86% from a billion today to 12 billion in 2020. So you have these two trends around why we should care about programmatic TV. The overall secular trend about TV and consumption of commercials and the spend shift into this medium. That's why we're here. And the kicker is, as I mentioned, this story is a story about an evolution, a revolution in the ecosystem, where you have to have brands like Lynn Fittick. We'll talk uh, with Michael in terms of what his brand means and where he's going, what he's trying to achieve, partnering with agencies that are out in front, trying to bring together the different touch points for those consumers, powered by technology partners, DISH providing a new marketplace, and Rocket Fuel providing the intelligence, as some of their other partners as well, to access this new marketplace. And we'll talk a little bit about those ecosystems. So I'd like to introduce our panelists, and then I'll have Adam come up and talk a little bit. Um, Adam Gaynor is a VP of uh, Meteor Sales and Analytics at Dish. He was one of the first five employees who pioneered Dish Media Sales Team in 2008. Uh, he served as the Executive Director of Digital Media and Intertaf Advertising for Game Show Network. And I think it really, when we were chatting last night, just the fact that he's been part of the addressable revolution addressable TV revolution, and being able to apply those backgrounds and experiences as we move into the programmatic TV. And he'll spend a couple of minutes talking about what that means. Uh, Jared Caparino, the president and CEO of Re uh, Resolute Digital. As we were talking last night, Jared, in 1998, was actually doing TV planning. And he was asked to be the first digital planner because he was young, right? Like That was his qualification <coughs> to do digital planning in 1998. Fast forward 20 years, he's back to TV. Back to TV. And then finally, we have Michael Giardina, the senior brand manager at Glenn Fittick. Really interesting background and experience with very large brands, including uh, Planters, Peanuts, and Nabisco, Bazooka Bubblegum, Heineken, and uh, Kraft Foods. With each of those brands, what he says, he talks about, is how do you create an authentic experience that is relevant to today? And so some of these brands are older brands. And how do you bring them forward in a compelling way in storytelling? and this opportunity to program back TV. So I'd like to uh, turn it over to Adam to talk a little bit about the how of what we actually did as a partnership. Uh, thank you, Randy. Uh, I'm excited to be here and to talk about programmatic TV because programmatic TV is here. And the reason it's here, um, if you think about it, there are still 100 million households in this country that pay for television. That means in those 100, house 100 million households, there's a TV on the wall. It may be a 30 inch or a 40 inch or a 50 inch, but there's a TV on the wall. And that TV serves as a place where the consumer could come and watch content. So for us, we knew that there was an opportunity for us to involve that TV in a marketplace where the lines are being blurred. You have people that can watch content on tablets, on phones, on computers. And as a marketer, you can reach those audiences through programmat digital programmatic. But what you can't do is reach that audience on television. So when I challenged my team about a year and a half ago or so, I said, how do we move our industry forward? How do we do more with what we have? So the best way to start is we had an incredible addressable, we still have an incredible addressable advertising technology. In 2012, we introduced our addressable technology to our marketplace. And this was now the first time where a brand can deliver a specific message to a specific household. And the way that it started was applying data to television, something that really hadn't been done before. So an advertiser would come to us and say, who can we target? And we'd show them our list of attributes and say, you can target whoever you want on this list. 
and we then take an ad and we deliver it through our set top boxes just to those households. And we went, wow, right? We eliminate the waste or we minimize the waste. But it was the first time we really were able to connect brands to consumers. So as addressable has evolved, we're now much more focused on targeting. So rather than someone saying to us, who can we target? This is about taking first party data and third party data and marrying it to the rich, powerful first party subscriber data that Dish has. We know our subscribers. And we can match that data. Sometimes clients even bring their own data. We call it BYOD, bring your own data. So any data source can be matched with our data source. And that's what truly provides the targeting capability. But as we sit here in January of 2016, really where we are with addressable technology today is all about ROI. So it's not just using data on the front end to find the audience. It's using data on the back end to report out on how that campaign went. So whether it's sales lift or brand recall, the data on the back end helps to have this full circle um, information about a campaign. So um, how does it work? Well, the first and foremost, the more addressable advertising I do, the more underlying impressions I have left. So let me explain that. I have to take full 30 second spots out of my out of sale. When I take those out of sale, I slice and dice them to get the right audience for the right message. But what's left are some impressions that just don't get targeted. It's not remnant, because ESPN in prime time on a Monday night is hardly remnant. Those are premium impressions. So I now have this trove of premium impressions that I can now put into what we call a central hub. It's best described as an SSP, right? This is a sales side platform, a supply side platform. So what we put is we put the inventory into that platform. We put our pricing parameters and other rules and regulations into the platform. But we've also loaded the platform with 80 predefined data segments. That platform is then exposed to a great partner like Rocket Fuel, who in turn will expose it to their great partners and clients um, who want to look at programmatic television. So what happens is once that data is exposed, it gives a brand like Glenn Fittick, an opportunity to do real-time bidding. Now, the bidding happens in 200, you know, less than 200 nanoseconds, right? It's, it's quick. That bid is absolutely real-time. But the buy is not real-time. So what we're doing here is we're creating a futures marketplace. We are projecting the types of impressions we're going to have available for our brands to uh, bid on. But we need our set-top boxes in the addressable technology to report back information. So we have to wait until about 80,000 impressions are pulled together before we trigger the campaign. Once we have those impressions, that campaign runs, and we're off to the races. And that's where everybody gets excited. Because once that campaign starts running, we get into this continuous feedback loop. And the best way to describe this continuous feedback loop is a continual optimization engine. The data that comes back from the campaigns gives our partners like Rocket Fuel information, but more importantly, it gives brands and agencies information as well to be able to take what's worked and optimize along the way. Once that takes place, we get into this reporting side of the platform. And that's where Dish can tell Rocket Fuel, here's what we did. And Rocket Fuel can tell Resolute, here's what we did. And Resolute can tell Glenn Fittick what we did, and everybody claps, and we all have a nice steak dinner at some point, right? But it's also that reporting that feeds back into the central hub so that we can help our futures market. Once we know what's out there on the set-top box, we can keep planning for it. OK, so the question always comes up is, how does, how does programmatic TV differ from addressable TV? And frankly, how does my programmatic platform differ from what everybody else is calling programmatic TV? So I'll answer the first question first. Programmatic is not addressable, and addressable is not programmatic. But they partner with each other. Addressable is a technology. Programmatic is a marketplace. So we absolutely use our addressable technology, meaning the ability to get into an individual household. But our addressable platform, and our addressable technology, gives advertisers an opportunity to say, hey, I'm trying to reach moms, soccer moms who want to buy minivans. 
Okay, so we'll go into the sandbox and we'll find all the moms who want to buy minivans and we'll pull them together, put them in a bucket and say, okay, here's your target audience. We'll take an ad and we'll deliver it to that target audience. The programmatic platform is different in that I'll still go into the sandbox, but I'm exposing all of the soccer moms in the sandbox and allowing the agencies and the brands to pick exactly which impressions they want to buy, impression by impression. And that's important because every impression, aka a household in our case, has a different value and a different quality. So let the brands choose exactly which households they want and how they want them. So that's that difference. But the other difference is why is this programmatic TV opportunity different than what we've been hearing for you know, a while in programmatic TV? And the answer is, up until this platform, programmatic TV really meant applying some level of data to linear television. And what that resulted in was saying, all right, this program on this network, on this day part, on this channel, at this time, on this day, right, is more likely to have your target audience. Well, we take the guesswork out of most likely. We don't want to look at where they most likely will be. Our platform allows brands to actually connect directly with those brands. So the programmatic platform that we have is all about delivering impression by impression that specific audience. Not a propensity to have that audience, but a specific audience. So, most importantly, it's about controlling the message. When we went out to build this platform, one of the things that we looked at was how the digital marketplace works. What's the process? Well, there's a lot of controls and tools that the digital marketplace has. And we want to introduce that on the television screen as well. So that means reach and frequency and some of the other tools that are used. Again, this is impression by impression. And that's so important because that has never been done on television before. This gives brands the opportunity to use the same process that they use online on television. And it's about targeting the households. Again, it's not really about finding the, the spots that most likely will hit the target. This is about actually delivering that message to that household. But to me, one of the coolest things, and one of the things I get most excited about, is for a brand to maximize its message. And here's what I mean. People have big screens in their house, I don't think this big, but we'll, we'll pretend. The ad that Glenn Fittick runs is never below the fold on that TV screen. In fact, it's always above the fold. Furthermore, it's actually the whole screen. There's no bot watching television. I'm pretty sure there's humans in front of the television, our algorithms tell us that. And there's no ad blockers on television. And so for a brand to be able to use the same controls that they have online and apply that to buying that audience, that really impactful 100 million households of people that want to watch television, that's a pretty cool thing. Efficiently purchasing impressions is the key, because at the end of the day, you want to get the biggest bang for your buck. And then lastly, and I think also very important, is this holistic view. Again, the lines are blurring from a content perspective. Do you watch on a tablet? Do you watch on a phone? Do you watch on a computer? And marketers have been able to connect with those, those audiences up until now. But here, we can introduce television into that same marketplace. And for a brand to have that holistic view of wherever their consumer is, whatever they're watching, whenever they're watching, however they're watching, we can deliver that message. So I'll end by saying programmatic TV is here. We are open for business. We're doing business. We've got incredible partners up here. And it's important to note that if we didn't have um, partners like Resolute and Glenn Fittick um, to experiment and to want to push the envelope in how this industry is growing, we wouldn't have a business. So working with Rocket Fuel, working with brands, working with agencies, that's how we intend to move this business forward. So Randy, I'll turn it back yeah, over thanks, to you. Yeah, thanks, Adam. Appreciate Thank it. Um, so let's. Let's pick up on that conversation. We've been doing this now for, we launched in November. Um, what I'd love to do is just start by saying, so what have you learned so far? What has been interesting to you? Uh, uh, Michael, why don't we start with you for Glenn Fittick? Sure, so I mean, the numbers are still out. We're still doing analysis of the numbers. We definitely gained efficiencies, right? Efficiencies in targeting, efficiencies in, in, in cost or cost per impression versus buying an upfront or, or even spot TV. 
Uh, so that's for sure. Um, you know, I think on the other side, another learning. Um, for me, it's important to use my media buys to gain excitement internally and with my distributors. I cannot sell directly to a liquor store or a bar or a restaurant. I have to go through a distributor. Thank you, Prohibition. <laughs> so for me to get them excited, and they're not going to understand all this, right? So I need to just give them a, a number and say, this is where it's going to be. I didn't have that ability. So a learning going forward is working with these guys and better planning so we can give them some of that excitement and that, and that jazz, but still deliver the efficiency efficiencies um, and the targeting that we did. So I think those were the two big learnings for me. If we can pick up on your uh, point, we were talking a little bit last night in terms of how you thought about TV. And then Adam, you were suggesting that programmatic TV seems to be a, a, a on-ramp for people who have never advertised on TV before. So digital advertisers moving into TV rather than necessarily TV advertisers moving into, uh, uh, into uh, programmatic TV. But I was just wondering, uh, can you talk a little bit, Michael, about how you thought about TV and why this is a new way for you to access TV? Yeah, so we're relatively new in the TV game. Digital was more of our focus, um, mainly because of the efficiencies and the ability to target. Historically, before programmatic, it's greater on digital. We are not a mass brand. We're not for everybody. Uh, you know, some of our products, our most expensive product costs $31,000 for a bottle. That's not going to be every household that's going to buy that bottle. So targeting is, is very important to us. And if I were to buy TV in a normal way, tons of waste there. So we, we're digital first. However, the role TV plays in my world is not so much about reach. Um, it's more about cache. Right? If you get on the right platforms, and that big screen still has a lot of power behind it in terms of, of the image you can put and the spotlight you can put on that brand, especially if you can get it next to the right shows and the right programs. Um, you can borrow the equity from the screen itself and from the programs you're on. So for me, TV is more about equity and creating a cachet for a brand to hopefully make someone spend $31,000 for a bottle. Um, and digital is more about the, the broader reach so, so we kind of invert what you would normally do for a mass brand who's really using TV for reach and digital for, for tar tight targeting. And so Jared, that must be one of the things as far as the lesson learned here, how to bring those two objectives together in a different context around TV. Were there any other ones that you sort of... <clears throat> well, I mean, for us it's about four screens. Four um, screens, yeah. Four screens. So you have your, your desktop computer, your tablet, your phone, and now the TV. Um, so when we you know, do our planning for Glenfiddich, it's how do we reach our user um, and, and you know, using data to find out who that user really is, and how do we reach them across those four screens? Um, what message do we give them across the four screens? Uh, and something that we've learned um, from this programmatic buy, which was great, is you know, a week into the buy, we, we noticed that um, although we gave an age range, it was skewing on the higher end. Um, you know, in certain states and certain markets, we wanted to skew that lower. So for us, it was the first time to really uh, you know, react to television data coming in, uh, you know, within days and change our targeting parameters. And what had it been? Like when you were using campaigns, TV campaigns in the past, how long would it take for you to be able to optimize you're, a campaign? You're looking at post, uh, you know, post campaign. Yeah, you can. So 90 report. days? A year, probably. A year? <laughs> yeah. I mean, so, you know, all the digital guys, there. digital denizens out there, like, hey, real-time optimization, 200 milliseconds, like, we're talking a different world in yeah. TV. Right. So being able to reduce it from a year semi-annual, yeah. 90 days to within a week was really... It really uh, depends how you're buying that TV media, yeah, but for yeah. the most part, and you're in a bigger, you know, more mass brand, you're buying in the upfront, you have your year laid out, and you're doing the analysis at the end of the year to go into next year's planning. So yeah, in most, that's it's about a year. Yeah. And for us, we do a lot of programmatic uh, display buying. Yeah. Um, so we, you know, we love buying on an impression, uh, you know, picking all of the attributes, uh, you know, so, you know, in the, this particular, uh, you know, tests that we did, I mean, we had 80 different segments. We had, you know, sports targeting, soccer targeting. We, for us, we want to bid, as you mentioned, that soccer mom. You know, it could one soccer mom could be worth a dollar more CPM right. than, than the other based on, on the attributes. Uh, so for us, that was fun of really, uh, you know, fine-tuning this, this TV bot. 
that's one of the things we talk about is, is you know, the evolution moving forward, and we'll shift the conversation in a second to, you know, from oppression buying to this moment scoring and be able to, to, to bid on the moment. Like, what is the opportunity with the person who's showing up, the context that they're operating within, and the advertiser who wants to participate is, how much is that moment worth? Yeah. How does that score play out to inform your ability to bid? I don't know, Adam, did you have any sort of lessons learned top of mind for you? Yeah, I mean, so I think the first thing we learned is this thing is hard. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so we're trying to do something new and innovative inside of a, you know, a, 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 an infrastructure that's 50 or 60 years old. <laughs> it, it, it's hard. Um, you know, I think we, we learned so much when we built the addressable platform that we took a lot of the learnings of just technology learnings. That, that's the first and foremost is you know, the ones and zeros and where they go in the code to make everything work. So, so we learned a, a lot there. Um, but I think what we've learned as we've now been working in this platform for a little bit is that maybe the 80 segments aren't enough. So, uh, you know, what we're looking at is how we can add more segments or how we can do some of the customized data uh, sets into the platform. Um, we've learned some things like, you know, the, the triggers that we put into the platform of what the day parts you can buy. Maybe they need to be a little bit wider. Maybe they need, in some cases, need to be narrower. So while we're in this in this um, this phase of the build out of the launch, I should say, um, we're, we're starting to to pull some strings to make it fit a little bit better for everybody in the in the infrastructure. Got it. And so, Michael, as you sort of look broadly across this campaign, what does success look like for you for the test? I mean, to Adam's point, you're learning a bunch of stuff. You're sort of it's uh, efficient right now because yeah. it is in a, 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 a dense marketplace. But what did, what's success for you so that you would move forward out of an experimental medium and spend to really having it integrated into your plan? Yeah, I mean, one, I think confirming that we did create efficiencies, right? right. Efficiencies in pricing and then optimized our targeting. And we really were hitting the people who we wanted to hit. Um, and, and I think the last thing is, is learning. I mean, going into this and, and my company, is it's one of our core values is freedom to win. Uh, family-run company that's kind of been fueled by this innovative spirit uh, for over 128 years. So we're very much encouraged to take risks, obviously calculated risks. Um, as long as we learn, not every risk is going to be successful. As long as you don't blow up the business yeah. and you learn, that's <laughs> fine. So learning is definitely uh, part of that success criteria. And I think, Adam, you had said in the addressable experiment that actually the advertisers that were in early learning the most quickly are the ones who are spending the most now and finding the most value. So there is this idea of get in, start playing with it, with experimental dollars and iterate Yeah, quickly. I mean, look, I, we, we have clients that had to carve out experimental dollars when we first launched. And now there are addressable budgets in the TV marketplace. Yeah. And so, right, I think the, you know, as our business has grown substantially, um, the folks that have been with us for the last few years, pushing and prodding and testing and pulling, and you know, are the ones that are most successful and the ones that are actually most experimental even today with how they use data to inform TV buys. And so, Jared, like as you think about it, this test is assume it's successful. What does it take for you to, to move it to other brands? Sure. I mean, Glenn uh, Finnick is one of those <clears throat> Maverick whiskeys. They're going to be out in front trying to create a unique experience. Right. How do you think about it? Well, I mean, first of all, it was great for us. Whenever you have a client that's willing to to test new things, because it's also a learning experience for us. And you know, we made the conscious decision to say that this buy inside of our agency is going to be done by our digital media planners and buyers. Oh, interesting, versus your TV. Yeah. So the ones yeah. that are familiar with uh, programmatic buying that are doing it on a, you know, on a daily basis for, you know, for all of our display advertising. Um, and from a results standpoint, I mean, it's, you know, uh, again, we're still analyzing everything, but, you know, the efficiency is definitely there. The targeting is definitely there. Um, you know, trying to get some, you know, bigger, uh, bigger TV budgets there. I mean, uh, reach would be, or scalability, I should say, not even reach. Is something that we're waiting for and are eager for the marketplace to yeah. to, ha to get and to have. Um, yeah, I think that's a good segue. Like if we just are getting closing on the session, but really, what will it take to make programmatic yeah. real? I think you were just speaking to the number one is addressability, addressability at scale. Can you talk a little bit more about what you think about what what would that have to be like for this to really take root? Yeah, well, I mean, so just from if you look at our our media plans as a whole. Um, you know, our programmatic buying, you know, we're, we're not buying 100% programmatic, right? right? So it's a, it's a complement to, uh, to our buys. 
Um, but when you're looking at, at scale here, and you mentioned 100 million households, and you know, the more inventory, obviously, the better. Um, we, we think there's a tremendous advantage for us right now. It's kind of the early days of the programmatic display buying where uh, you, know, you don't have too many bidders in there right now. So the efficiency is, is amazing. It's actually better than what we would get uh, from a pricing standpoint. Go early. Right? Go early. Get in or get, get um, early. You know, we were expecting going in here to pay more than what we would normally would on a CPM for a TV spot, just given the targeting. Um, and you know, luckily with this test, it, that hasn't been the case. We've actually paid less and got more targeting. Great. And then Adam, just on the on the sort of second trend, you were talking a little bit about the household targeting. And yeah. In our conversation last night, we were talking about in, you know winning the living room is something I remember being at Microsoft in 1994 talking about Xbox owning the living room experience. And and you fast forward to today, and we're in a really different space where you have these multi-screen experiences in the living room, and so you're getting to the household level. But really, this next um, sort of level of detail of understanding the, the people and doing people-based yeah. attribution. So right. So in the television arena, we're going to stick with household addressability. We get right down to the household, which is better than we've ever had before because it's not zip code, it's not state, it's not city. You know, it's the house, right? And if all four of us live next to each other, we would be able to see a different ad watching the same program. Where I think we get the future is you know, I work for a very innovative company, and I'm very thankful to work for Dish that is just leading the charge and changing the way people uh, watch television and can, can have television. Um, we launched Sling Television last year. So Sling is an OTT product. Um, my sales team has access to that inventory as well. And so the next phase of our programmatic platform is to be able to include other inventory that may have the ability to go down to the person level. Because yeah. at least on Sling, it's an account by person. So we're looking into that, and that's really the next phase for us to make this more real. The people-based marketing and people-based attribution. And the third trend I think you highlighted as well is really the only way this works is if the marketers out there with innovative brands and innovative approaches are driving it because they control the plans. And so this isn't going to be for everyone, but I think there's a unique opportunity right now to create really unique value and create unique experiences with consumers, either current uh, consumers of the, of the whiskey or the, the, the prospects you're going after. I mean, what do you think is your next big bet in, in innovation for your brand? In terms of media? Yeah, in terms of media. In terms of media? You know, that's, that's a good question. It, it's almost like trying to pick the future trend, which is part of what this whole, yeah, right. and, and you know, how many succeed and don't, you don't know. I, I'm not really sure what the future trend for media for us is uh, I'll probably certainly continue uh, exploring mm -hmm. programmatic. Yeah. I think it makes sense for us. I, I think part of your point about you know needing the brands and the partners to do this, for me this wasn't that hard of a decision. Mm. You know it was it's, it's more about trust. Do you trust your partner that they're bringing you legitimate solutions to your yeah. businesses? Do you trust in, in that what they're saying they're going to do? They can actually do, and then if you have that trust, to me, it, it, it was black and white, right? Yeah. I, I can target more. I probably get a better rate. I already have a budget that I'm going to put a TV, so I can just shift some. Why wouldn't I do that? So I, I don't think it's the numbers pay out. It's more, do you have that relationship with your partners that you think that they have your best interests in heart? And, and that's what it was for me, and, and I do, and we went forward with it. So that's great. For us, that marketing innovation is. I, I'd love to target a household or you know, the next step of a, an actual particular person in a household, uh, show them a TV ad, and when they're on their tablet, be able to show them a continuing ad on their tablet yeah. at the same time. Um, creating that creating experience, that, that building experience, building experience exactly. and bringing it back and showing exactly. the reporter. That's the promised land, right? Yes. Great. Well, uh, thank you for the time, and I think this has been a great conversation. We'd like to continue that conversation. Hashtag PTV is here. Uh, please join us in the interweb, and uh, we'll continue that conversation as well as we'd like to continue the conversation at the reception, which we're kicking off uh, with some Glenfiddich in the room right next door. So thank you for your attention, appreciate your time, and look forward to continuing the conversation.